Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And that penguin on your screen is not just there because I love penguins, but instead to presage a brand new story here in Virtual Legality that might become something more, but it's also a bit unusual. If you've been following along with the channel for a while now, you know that we've been talking an absurd amount about United States antitrust laws. Here is 57 videos, an antitrust epic on Epic, suing Apple, suing Google, looking for changes in those laws in the context of online platforms and big technology. Well, today's story isn't about online platforms and big technology, but it is likely important for one of the big questions that people wind up asking me about this topic. And that is, what can we expect both from the trial court and Epic versus Apple, from the appeals court, from the U.S. government, from other jurisdictions? And a lot of the time I have to answer, well, we don't know. For one thing, the enforcement of the antitrust laws change in the United States really based on every new presidential administration. So we've been waiting with somewhat bated breath for President Biden and his Department of Justice or his Federal Trade Commission to move forward against some or more of these companies. Now, today he did that, but he didn't do it against an online platform operator. No, he and his Department of Justice have gotten involved in something a little bit smaller, but also which gives away a little bit of the direction that he's intending to take antitrust enforcement. So let's take a look. Here we've got an article from November of 2020, and I'm bringing this up primarily so that we can set the stage, but also to mention that when I comment on headlines and journalistic practices not working in the video game industry, it is not at all unique to that. Here you see the headline, Viacom CBS sells Simon & Schuster to Penguin Random House for $2 billion. And that number's a little bit off, but it's a headline. But what's important here is that, no, nothing got sold when this headline went up. And in fact, if you scroll through all this, you'll actually see a reference to the fact that closing is set for 2021. But in terms of background, it's important to understand what framework this all happened in. Or as CNBC says, the deal comes after Viacom CBS put the global publisher up for auction, a move it made to divest non-core assets from its company. So Viacom CBS, big media conglomerate, owns Simon & Schuster and says, we need to divest because we don't want to be quite as much of a conglomerate. We're putting it up for auction. It's going to be sold to somebody. Proceeds from the deal will be put towards Viacom CBS's streaming business, fund its dividend, and pay down its debt. The company also recently sold CNET for $500 million as a part of this strategy. And we've covered that a little bit here. That whole deal involved some video game outlets of some repute. But That's November 2020. As of today, November 2nd, 2021, Justice Department files antitrust suit to block $2 billion merger of Penguin Random House, Simon & Schuster. And this was framed by the New York Times, I think correctly, as the Biden administration's rejection of the proposed publishing merger reflects a changing atmosphere in Washington towards consolidation. If we go and we look at some of the quotes that the Justice Department put out, you'll see something pretty darn important. The U.S. Department of Justice filed a civil antitrust lawsuit today to block Penguin Random House's proposed acquisition of its close competitor, Simon & Schuster. As alleged in the complaint filed in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, this acquisition would enable Penguin Random House, which is already the largest book publisher in the world, to exert outsized influence over which books are published in the United States and how much authors are paid for their work. The complaint filed today to ensure fair competition in the U.S. publishing industry is the latest demonstration of the Justice Department's commitment to pursuing economic opportunity and fairness through antitrust enforcement, said Attorney General Merrick B. Garland. A lot of quotes about how great books are, and American authors and consumers, pay attention to where we see that word consumers, will pay the price of this anti-competitive merger, lower advances for authors, and ultimately fewer books and less variety for consumers. One of the things that is at the heart of antitrust reform attempts now in 2021 in the United States is what the standard should be in terms of 
the U.S. government stepping in and preventing certain activities in Epic versus Apple, whether or not that's a restraint of trade or illegal retention of monopoly power. Here, under a different act, the Clayton Act that we'll talk about as part of this video, whether or not a merger should be allowed to proceed and what it looks like when a merger would have deleterious effects on competition. For the longest time, this has been framed on the premise that what matters is the consumer, the end purchaser of these products. When we talk about somebody like Simon & Schuster or Penguin Random House, it's the sales of books to end users. Are you going to wind up increasing prices, harming the end user consumer level experience? What we're going to see in this document at the Department of Justice is that there's less of a focus on that consumer welfare standard And that matters because that's what's been an ongoing discussion, not just for book publishers, which are a little bit of a sideline issue here, but for online platforms. Or as this particular summary of the Cantor interviews at the Senate level went, who is going to be in charge of the antitrust division, if he's approved, in a possible departure from Federal Trade Commission Chair Lena Khan. Cantor suggested that he sees no need to depart from the consumer welfare standard, the standard under which antitrust enforcers and courts have analyzed antitrust conduct for several decades. Cantor agreed with Senator Mike Lee that the consumer welfare approach encompasses factors beyond price, such as quality, innovation, and consumer choice. We'll see that referenced in this lawsuit as well. Cantor clarified that he does not object to the standard itself, but rather to the way in which judges have historically interpreted the standard. In contrast, Khan the head of the Federal Trade Commission, has argued that the consumer welfare standard is short-sighted and not up to the task of policing online platform mergers. And you've seen this if you've followed the U.S. Senate at all, and pity on you if you have, but as bills are discussed and potentially brought up for passage, one of the conversations has been, should Congress identify a different standard under which the antitrust rules should be interpreted. Because another part of this story is that although we're going to look at the Department of Justice case, although we're going to look at the horizontal merger guidelines that are put forth by the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission to talk over what's happening here, the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice are executive branch agencies. They are but one part of one third of the U.S. government And they are not the final arbiters of how to read the antitrust laws. So the Department of Justice can bring a case and they'll win some of those cases and they'll lose some of those cases. The court system is ultimately in charge of how the laws are interpreted. And that's one of the things you see complained of by Lena Khan or by Cantor here. He's upset about the way judges have historically interpreted the standard to really focus on that end user experience. So this, as we take a look at this particular case, pay attention to how that is referenced here and how little of the end user kind of level is actually addressed in this lawsuit because it does evidence a new position for the Department of Justice, for the Biden administration that you may agree with, you may not agree with. I want to talk about what's happening here before we get into the policy prescriptions of what's right because I think understanding what's happening is really the first step towards having those more long form discussions. So as we dive in here, the first thing we see are the parties. The United States of America is the plaintiff and they're suing Bertelsmann, Penguin Random House, Viacom CBS, and Simon & Schuster. Bertelsmann owns Penguin Random House, Viacom owns Simon & Schuster. And then we get the introduction, whereas we've talked about here in virtual legality, this is where you put everything important up front so that if you only have someone's attention for 30 seconds, they see what you want them to focus on. And the very first sentence does that. Authors are the lifeblood of book publishing. And this will be reflected in the rest of this document. The focus of this case brought by the Department of Justice is that authors are going to be harmed by this merger. There is very little discussion of how someone buying a book might be harmed. There are throwaway lines that try to address a kind of consumer welfare consideration. We will, of course, look at those. But the vast bulk of this document is these two parties are big players in bidding up the amounts paid for author services. And in particular, a sub slice of those services, which is the books we think are actually going to make money. And if you take two of those and make it one, authors are going to make less money. 
And to some extent, I think that is almost a tautological conclusion. It seems almost completely true insofar as if you don't have to bid against another party, it's likely that you're going to have less parties bidding against you. And so you're going to have to pay less money to those authors. The question becomes, is that sufficient enough of an issue for the U.S. government to step in and block a merger of this type, especially with very little attention paid to what the consumer experience is, which is used as the standard in antitrust actions because it kind of encompasses all of the things that go into why the U.S. government cares about competition at all. So let's dig in. Authors are the lifeblood of book publishing. Without authors, there would be no stories, no poetry, no biographies, no written discourse on history, arts, culture, society, or politics. In the words of Penguin Random House's U.S. CEO, books have the power to sustain us, particularly in challenging times. Books matter. Now, interestingly, we're actually going to be talking about the books that get heavy advances and not so much textbooks and things about history or coffee table books about art and culture, but we'll leave that aside. Penguin Random House's proposed acquisition of Simon & Schuster would result in substantial harm to who? To authors, particularly authors of anticipated top-selling books. Penguin Random House is the world's largest book publisher, and Simon & Schuster is the fourth largest U.S. book publisher. You see already a kind of interesting combination of facts here. Penguin Random House, biggest in the world. Simon & Schuster is the fourth biggest in the U.S. Together, their U.S. revenues would be twice that of their next closest competitor. It's a big company after this merger. One reason the big five publishers are able to offer authors higher advances than smaller publishers is because they can spread the costs and risks of their investment over a large number of books and authors. And here's where we start to get into kind of really weird economic arguments, right? Again, if we're basing this all on the consumer welfare standard, which is what the courts are likely to read these acts regarding, regardless of what the FTC and the DOJ say at any given administration or point in time, then if you start in paragraph five in your introduction by saying, well, if you get bigger and you have more books, you can pay authors more because you can spread your investments over a larger number of books and authors, I as a lowly lawyer talking about this on YouTube, look at that and say, didn't you just make the case that there are efficiencies to be gained by Penguin Random House in purchasing Simon & Schuster and that those efficiencies can result actually in more money going to authors because they can spread their investment out over more risk? No, that's not what the Department of Justice wants you to take away from that paragraph at all. They want you to establish in your mind that the big five publishers work because they're big and can spread that risk, but that's also why the smaller publishers can't be adjudged as part of this marketplace that they're trying to establish. One of the big problems the Department of Justice has when they set out to write this and they're looking at a blank page is the person that comes in and says, wait a minute, it's 2021. Can't you self-publish and put anything you want on Amazon? Aren't there hundreds of publishers that you could go find if you need help with distribution or advertising or whatever else it might need? How can you be commenting on a consolidation of power in this marketplace in this year when we've probably never had more options for publishing our own works at to become authors at any level in United States society? They try to address that by saying, well, We're going to only be talking about high-level advances to top-selling authors, and we're going to make the market that. If consummated, the Department of Justice continues, this merger would likely result in substantial harm to authors of anticipated top-selling books, uh, and, and ultimately consumers. Consumers too, we think, maybe. Penguin Random House would control close to half of the market for the acquisition of publishing rights to anticipated top selling books. It's unclear exactly how the market will be split amongst market participants from just acquiring normal-ish books to anticipated top-selling books. But there seems to be an economics argument here made by the Department of Justice that when you exceed a certain amount of money, those other companies are just incapable of doing it. And also, presumably, that if there were consolidation and those author rates came down, that that wouldn't result in more participation from more publishers that could otherwise pay those lesser amounts and result in a higher aggregate payment to authors of all kinds. But again, one of the problems with antitrust law in general, this isn't on the Department of Justice or Federal Trade Commission or anyone else, 
is that it's all kind of guessing, throwing words at a page that says, this is what's going to happen to the market if you allow this kind of merger to proceed. It's very complicated, for lack of a better word. Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster compete head-to-head to acquire publishing rights to hundreds of books every year, and this competition has resulted in substantial benefits for authors of anticipated top-selling books. There's not even the hand wave at consumers here. And this chart, pretty compelling. You see Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster, if combined, presumably the the tan here is Simon & Schuster, will be making this many advances, Cetris Paribus, all other things being equal, as compared to these advances. Total advances for anticipated top-selling books 2020. Now, there's all sorts of problems with that market definition anyway, because anticipated doesn't mean top selling. What is actually top selling in 2020? What does that chart look like? There's all sorts of things that might confound this issue a little bit. But what they're trying to establish is that there's only really going to be these four participants that can give, you know, up to 500, 500 plus million dollars to authors to make books. It says by harming authors, the merger is also likely to harm consumers. I was very interested in this. How do you think? Penguin Random House's global CEO has recognized the principle that reducing author pay means fewer authors will be able to make a living from writing, which in turn will have an impact on the output. By reducing author pay, this merger would make it harder for authors to earn a living by writing books, which would in turn lead to a reduction in the quantity and variety of books published. Now, that's an open question. That's an assertion, right? So you've got... Penguin Random House, Simon & Schuster, they're regularly bidding against each other for authors to make books for them. They get the manuscript. They say, this is worth $8 million. And the other side says, oh, this is worth $9 million. That's great for authors. But having those two parties bidding up the cost of the goods that they wish to sell to consumers is also, in all likelihood, being passed on in part to consumers. So if you do have an efficiency that is realized by not bidding against them for authors, The question does become, as the Department of Justice poses here, do you wind up with fewer books? And in all honesty, I don't know the answer to that. Generally speaking, Economics 101, if you lower the aggregate price, you're going to get less supply. But if you don't have enough supply to actually sell to your consumer base, you're going to increase that price. So there's an open question as to whether or not the market for authors just kind of dissipates if there are fewer publishing houses to go to, especially in a world where you can self-publish, you can do work for hire, you can do whatever else you want as an author of written material. The Department of Justice continues, there is no reason to accept the harm to competition threatened by this merger, although defendants have publicly suggested that the merger is necessary to create a stronger counterweight to Amazon, Penguin Random House's global CEO privately admitted that he never bought into that argument. Okay. I'm pretty sure that the Department of Justice wouldn't allow Penguin Random House to buy us, but that's assuming we still have a Department of Justice, said the Simon & Schuster CEO in March 2020, presumably referring to the elections coming up that year. As a consequence of that risk, Bertelsmann, who, remember, owns Penguin Random House, understood that it would have to pay a significant premium over other bidders to acquire Simon & Schuster. So there's an antitrust risk identified by Simon & Schuster. They don't really want to get involved in a sale that is going to be wound back by the United States Department of Justice. So the Department of Justice here suggests that Simon & Schuster got overpaid because this was a risk. Again, not really seeing a problem from the Simon & Schuster's Viacom CBS perspective, and especially keeping in mind as we discuss all of these complaints, that The impetus behind this was that Simon & Schuster was going away as an independent entity, that Viacom CBS had decided they didn't want any part of it anymore. So the question becomes not, is it something that should be allowed to be purchased by Simon & Schuster versus just going on as one of the big five publishers, but is it better that it be purchased by Simon & Schuster or purchased by one of the other big four or a brand new party? If it is a brand new party, you can see the argument that says, hey, competition's a little bit stronger because you're still going to have bidding wars. If it's not, where do you draw the line if you're the Department of Justice? Defendants in the proposed transaction, Bertelsmann, as I've said, is an international media and services company headquartered in Germany. Bertelsmann has numerous subsidiaries, including Penguin Random House and the Bertelsmann Printing Group. In 2020, Penguin Random House earned $2.4 billion in U.S. publishing revenues. It's a lot of money. 
Viacom CBS, also an international media company, and its assets include Simon & Schuster. And by comparison, in 2020, Simon & Schuster earned over $760 million in U.S. publishing revenue. So only a portion of the size of Penguin Random House when they would otherwise agree to this sale. On November 25th, 2020, Bertelsmann and Viacom CBS announced that Penguin Random House would acquire Simon & Schuster from Viacom CBS in an all-cash deal valued at approximately $2.175 billion. So keeping in mind that we just went through an acquisition by Microsoft of $8.5 billion of the ZeniMax Bethesda entities with really nary a whiff of any problems on the antitrust level from either the European Union or the U.S. federal government. This is a much smaller deal focused on a very particular sub-market. U.S. General Trade Book Publishing. The term general trade books is widely used in the publishing industry and refers to books that are published for wide public consumption, including both fiction and a variety of nonfiction, such as biographies, cookbooks, travel guides, and self-help books. It does not include academic texts or professional manuals. Bringing a book to market in the United States requires the participation of many different entities, including authors and their agents, publishers, printers, distributors, wholesalers, retailers, and ultimately readers. Somebody does actually have to buy these things in order to make the whole concept viable. Continuing with a little bit more background, most authors do not earn out their advance, and thus their advance generally constitutes their entire earnings from the book. So what it's proposing here in this complaint is that there's a type of author, the ones that are anticipated to actually make money for these companies, that receive advances that are very, very high and that would otherwise earn royalties as you would normally expect, but those royalties are only paid after the mathematics in that contract would have yielded the advanced money to the author and then they're paid over that amount, and that most authors don't actually go above that number, that the advance is actually incorporating whatever, the overhead related to publishing this book, and nobody anticipates actually paying that author more. But if you hit a big time shot, then you're still going to get paid if it's a home run for the publisher. It's essentially a safety play for most authors. And that means that advanced numbers matter for this particular market. The book publishing market in the United States is dominated by the big five publishers. In order to solicit the most attractive bids for their clients, authors' agents typically submit manuscripts to some or all of those big five publishers, especially Penguin Random House, which has by far the largest number of imprints and publishes the most new books in the United States. Imprints a little bit of a term of art for book publishing. It's essentially those brand names. When you see a publisher on a book, in all likelihood, it's an imprint of one of the bigger publishers rather than an independently published enterprise. While smaller publishers occasionally win auctions for anticipated top-selling books, it is the exception rather than the norm. Smaller publishers typically have lower marketing and promotional budgets, fewer experienced sales representatives, and less robust in-house distribution capabilities compared to the big five. Therefore, authors of anticipated top-selling books generally do not view smaller publishers as competitively significant options compared to the big five. That might well be true. Relevant markets. A typical starting point for merger analysis is defining a relevant market. As we've talked about in this space, it's by far the most important piece of an antitrust complaint is setting up the market properly. Because if you set it too broadly, virtually nothing that you do within that market is going to be deemed anti-competitive or monopolistic or anything else. And if you set it too narrowly, everything you could possibly do would be considered an illegal restraint of trade or monopolistic practice or an illegal merger etc. The proposed acquisition would result in the lessening of competition in each of the two product markets described below. Each of these products constitutes a line of commerce as that term is used in section 7 of the Clayton Act, 15 USC 18. So let's take a look at the law in question here. 15 USC 18, acquisition by one corporation of the stock of another. No person engaged in commerce shall acquire the whole or any part of the stock or other share capital of another person engaged also in commerce where the effect of such acquisition may be substantially to lessen competition or to tend to create a monopoly. If that doesn't sound any more specific to you than the Sherman Antitrust Act stuff we've read in this space, well, you're exactly right. The actual standard here is you're not allowed to do these things, which also include acquisitions of assets that's in these other sections, etc., if 
the body here, the court, would be to determine that the effect of that acquisition would be to substantially lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly. Now, monopoly doesn't actually play a part here. For the most part, what we're going to be discussing is what is called a monopsony. So rather than having complete power over a sales market, a monopsonist has complete power over a buying market, or at least substantial market power in that buying market. So here, the Department of Justice says, as described below, each relevant product market satisfies the hypothetical monopsonist test rather than monopolist test. First, the acquisition of U.S. publishing rights to books from authors is a relevant product market. The acquisition of U.S. publishing rights to books from authors is a relevant market and line of commerce. A hypothetical monopsonist of the U.S. publishing rights to books would profitably decrease the advances paid to authors by a small but significant non-transitory amount. So we're skipping a lot of the economics here because I don't think it's terribly useful to a conversation of this type. But much like we saw in Epic versus Apple, much like we've seen in the other descriptions we've looked at in this space, what you do to determine whether there's a problem here is you take a hypothetical and you say, all right, this new combined entity, here a monopsonist, so they're a single purchaser of potential services from authors. If they were to just say, okay, our standard advance is $5 million. If we make it $4.5 million, do we think that we can profit from that? That's 500,000 more in our pocket. How many authors are likely to leave us? And if we can profit from that, then the US court system and the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice here say, hmm, that might be a problem. Now, we don't care about it as much if the sellers here have other places to go, right? We're going to take a look at the horizontal merger guidelines in just a second. But if those sellers have other places to go, then this isn't really the kind of thing that the U.S. government likes to jump in on because they're substituting their own business judgment for the business judgment of these placeholders. And that's what's going to come up in these next few paragraphs. First, we're going to talk about self-publishing. Self-publishing, says the Department of Justice, is not a reasonable alternative for most authors seeking to sell the publishing rights to their books in exchange for an advance. Now that's, again, tautologically true. If you are an individual seeking to sell the publishing rights to the books that you wrote in exchange for an advance, self-publishing is not the answer because there's nobody to give you an advance. But by defining it that way, you've made it tautological. There's no space for having a conversation here. It would seem that the real market is just authors and it can be top authors if you want to subclass that market. But saying, hey, only if they want to exchange it for an advance changes this to an analysis that doesn't really make any sense. It says, by definition, self-publishing does not pay authors advances, which authors often use to fund their writing. But they would be getting royalties from moment one, so there's just not a lot of economics being discussed here. Self-publishing also does not include the breadth of editorial distribution and marketing services that are important factors in whether a book will become commercially successful. Indeed, an internal Simon & Schuster document acknowledged that self-publishing is not viewed as a threat to our core business. Authors of books would not substitute to self-publishing in sufficient numbers to deter a hypothetical monopsonist from imposing a small but significant non-transitory decrease in those advances. Obviously, as you can imagine, we're well into reasonable minds may differ territory and that parade of experts that we saw in Epic versus Apple. Now, hopefully, Unlike in Epic versus Apple, where the trial court basically told all the experts that they were full of it and didn't listen to them at all because she didn't like how all of those surveys were done, you can have effective experts testify to these various things that are helpful to the court if those experts deign to do so. So this is a raw assertion that this is hurting authors and that you could actually reduce those advances and the author's wouldn't have enough of a way to go self-publish. Similarly, some publishers hire authors on a work-for-hire basis to draft books conceived of by the publisher, not the author. The publisher and not the author owns the publishing rights in a work-for-hire arrangement. Moreover, such authors generally are compensated differently than authors who sell the rights to publish their books in exchange for an advance in royalties. And authors of books would not substitute to work-for-hire arrangements in sufficient numbers to deter a hypothetical monopsonist from imposing a small but significant non-transitory decrease in advances. Sure. Okay. Work for hire is a completely different kind of task than coming up with your own idea and positioning your manuscript among potential buyers. So I buy that one a little bit more than the self-publishing concept. What you don't see addressed really right here 
is the notion of if there are lesser prices paid, if that number comes down, aren't those numbers more in reach of more publishers creating kind of an updraft of possibilities for authors to buy? And in all honesty, if Simon & Schuster slash Penguin Random House are running low on authors and want to sell more books, aren't they keeping that price or even potentially increasing it since they will then be bigger, as said in the first couple of pages, to put that risk on a bigger library of potential book sales? We don't see those things addressed. Um, And that doesn't mean that they are killer silver bullet kind of arguments. I just would prefer to see those concepts actually discussed by the Department of Justice here. And that's putting aside the fact that this company was being sold anyway. And putting aside the fact that we're talking now about middlemen, we're talking about the cost of goods rather than consumer welfare for large portions of this document. The other market that they wish to say is affected here is actually a subset of the first market. The acquisition of the U.S. publishing rights to anticipated top-selling books is a relevant product market in line of commerce. The market for the acquisition of U.S. publishing rights to anticipated top-selling books is narrower than and included within the market for the acquisition of U.S. publishing rights to books. Now, this can be done because that Clayton Act actually talks about lines of commerce and talks about specific geographies. So if the Department of Justice or the Federal Trade Commission wants to argue these things, that, hey, if we make it even narrower, it's even more obvious that there's a problem, they can do so. But it's not nearly as strong as broadly the market for the sales of books and how consumers are affected. They talk a little bit about how this process takes place. They say, given the individualized nature of negotiations between authors and publishers, publishers can target authors of anticipated top selling books by offering lower advances and authors cannot arbitrage to avoid lower advances. And I don't know that you need to use the word arbitrage right there. The question is whether they can go to other parties, including the many other publishers that are operating in this space. As a result, a hypothetical monopsonist of anticipated top-selling books would profitably reduce advances paid to authors of anticipated top-selling books, presumably, by a small but significant non-transitory amount. We get the same kind of arguments we just saw. Self-publishing and work for hire arrangements are not reasonable alternatives, and not enough authors of anticipated top-selling books would switch to self-publishing or work for hire arrangements to deter a hypothetical monopolist, they meant to say monopsonist, from imposing a small but significant non-transitory decrease in advances. These all get cleaned up in an amended complaint. So you've got the basic thrust here, which is these two companies merging are going to limit the bidding for author services, and that's going to harm authors, which we care about with some specificity here, because also the lack of authors will reduce the type of books and number of books that are sold, and that will harm consumers, not on a pricing basis, because they can't really make that complaint. If the cost of goods to be sold is lower for the publishers, chances are that also is getting passed along to the consumer. So this might be something that actually adds efficiencies and lowers the price paid by consumers. That's not great for their argument. So they focus on these kind of non-price concepts. They say the proposed merger would eliminate a major competitor to Penguin Random House, already the market leader, and create a firm that controls a substantial share of the relevant markets. Post-merger, the market for the acquisition of U.S. publishing rights to anticipated top-selling books would be highly concentrated. The merger is presumptively unlawful. And here's where we get a little bit weird, right? So they put a footnote. Footnotes are important, as we've talked about in this space. And this footnote is strange. It says, to measure market concentration, courts often use the herfindahl hirschman Index, the HHI, as described in Section 5.3 of the Horizontal Merger Guidelines, which we'll take a look at momentarily. HHIs range from zero in markets with no concentration to 10,000 in markets where one firm has 100% market share. Under the horizontal merger guidelines, when a merger increases the HHI in any market by more than 200 and results in an HHI above 2,500, the market is highly concentrated and the transaction is presumed to be anti-competitive. Here, the proposed merger would create a highly concentrated market for the acquisition of U.S. publishing rights to anticipated top-selling books and is presumptively anti-competitive. We don't actually get the math here. Right, We've got some definitions that suggest that this last sentence says, well, after the merger, they'd have an HHI above 2,500 and that this merger is an increase of more than 200. There's suggestiveness in this footnote, but it's not actually an assertion. It's all this stuff from the horizontal merger guidelines. And then, oh, by the way, this is a highly concentrated market now. As long as you define it as U.S. publishing rights to anticipated top selling books and not U.S. publishing rights or global publishing rights or book sales 
or anything like that where they would have significant problems due to Amazon and anyone else that otherwise publishes eBooks and things like that. So they've got a problem with those definitions. It's not really fixed by that footnote, but it does give us an entry point to talk about the horizontal merger guidelines put forth by the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission. And as I said, what's important about this document as we kind of take a look at it is that it will seem very authoritative. The the Federal Trade Commission, the Department of Justice, believe that they are exactly correct in everything that they say here. And that's fine. In order to do their jobs, they have to believe in what they're saying. But they aren't the final deciders here as to how that Clayton Act language should be read. That actually is the court system. That's the function of the judiciary. This is executive. The law was written by the legislative and it will be adjudged by the judiciary. So what does the FTC and DOJ say about all this? Well, first we're talking about horizontal mergers. I should probably take a step back. So this is a merger between competitors. A vertical merger is where you've got like a retail chain purchased by somebody that makes things to be sold in that retail chain. It's it's vertical functionality across an entire supply chain. Horizontal merger is where you've got competitors that merge. Here, Simon & Schuster, Penguin Random House do effectively the same thing. They bid against each other. They're in the same marketplace. They merge and that goes away. And you might say, well, in any instance where there's a horizontal merger, isn't there a reduction in competition? There were two competitors. Now there's one or here there were five and now there's four. And you could have said that, but that's not the way the courts have interpreted it. Just like the Sherman Antitrust Act is not a restrict, is not a law that makes illegal every kind of restraint of trade, but only those that are unreasonable. Horizontal mergers are allowed in most instances, unless you cross some of these damning thresholds. So what does this document say? The agencies seek to identify and challenge competitively harmful mergers while avoiding unnecessary interference with mergers that are either competitively beneficial or neutral. Most merger analysis is necessarily predictive, requiring an assessment of what will likely happen if a merger proceeds as compared to what will likely happen if it does not. Given this inherent need for prediction, These guidelines reflect the congressional intent that merger enforcement should interdict competitive problems in their incipiency before they actually happen. And that certainty about anti-competitive effect is seldom possible and not required for a merger to be illegal. So we're already in the wishy-washy, hand-waving, equitable nature kind of zone. That Clayton Act, rightfully interpreted here as the Department of Justice and Federal Trade Commission does, says, hey, if you tend towards monopoly, if you have the potential to create competitive issues, then these departments can get involved. The unifying theme of these guidelines is that mergers should not be permitted to create, enhance, or entrench market power or to facilitate its exercise. A merger enhances market power if it is likely to encourage one or more firms to raise price, reduce output, diminish innovation, or otherwise harm, who? Not authors, customers, as a result of diminished competitive constraints or incentives. These guidelines principally describe how the agencies analyze mergers between rival suppliers that may enhance their market powers as sellers. Enhancement of market power by sellers, which I'm reading here for context, is not what we're talking about. The Department of Justice is talking about this as enhancement of market power by buyers, often elevates the prices charged to customers. Enhanced market power can also be manifest in non-price terms and conditions that adversely affect customers, including reduced product quality, reduced product variety, reduced service, or diminished innovation. When the agencies investigate whether a merger may lead to a substantial lessening of non-price competition, they employ an approach analogous to that used to evaluate price competition. Regardless of how enhanced market power likely would be manifested, the agencies normally evaluate mergers based on their impact on customers. The agencies examine effects on either or both of the direct customers and the final consumers. Here, it's a little bit different. Enhancement of market power by buyers, sometimes called monopsony power, has adverse effects comparable to enhancement of market seller power. Check out section 12. So we say, of course, let's scroll down a few pages to section 12. But the point is, one of the things that these agencies look at is how price will be affected for customers, how everything other than price will be affected to customers. And this document goes in a slightly different direction. Looking at section 12, mergers of competing buyers, in defining relevant markets, the agencies focus on the alternatives available to sellers in the face of a decrease in the price paid by a hypothetical monopsonist. 
market power on the buying side of the market is not a significant concern if suppliers have numerous attractive outlets for their goods or services. It's an important sentence. Just as a hypothetical, if this merger takes place, do you, listener or viewer of virtual legality, believe that an author has numerous attractive outlets for their goods or services that remain? Bare minimum, there's still four big publishers. There's a whole host of additional publishers outside of that big four number. And we do have a kind of broad publishing capability in 2021. That doesn't mean you'll get big time advances. But is there a right as a author to big time advances? And should the government be protecting what is the existing business model for authorship? Another side question to this kind of proceeding. When that is not the case, when sellers, authors here, don't have those attractive outlets, the agencies may conclude that the merger of competing buyers is likely to lessen competition in a manner harmful to those sellers, the authors. Reduction in prices paid by the merging firms not arising from the enhancement of market power can be significant in the evaluation of efficiencies from a merger as discussed in section 10. We're not going to highlight that section. But part of this conversation is also, okay, maybe we lessen competition a bit, but do we gain efficiencies? It doesn't get you out of the Clayton Act analysis completely, but certainly the Department of Justice and Federal Trade Commission isn't really interested in stopping business combinations that actually are more efficient, that provide better services for for less price to customers at the end stage. One of the questions that I think will be raised in a defense here from the merger participants is that, well, We're increasing efficiencies. If we get rid of that bidding or if we reduce it, authorship isn't going to go down, which they're going to have to make a raw assertion as well, but we're going to be able to pass on the savings to customers and make more and better books available to more people around the globe, et cetera, et cetera, that kind of thing. You don't have to buy that, but that's the kind of defense you're likely to see. Nor do the agencies evaluate the competitive effects of mergers between competing buyers strictly or even primarily on the basis of effects in the downstream markets in which the merging firms sell. Now, here's where things get interesting, right? This is the horizontal merger guidelines talking about monopsony power and doing what the Biden DOJ is doing in this document. Hey, if we can show that this is a problem for sellers, authors are sellers of services in this context, then we might not care that much about the downstream markets in which the merging firms sell. This is where things get weird as in connection with how the judiciary might see these kinds of questions. Look at example 24. Merging firms A and B are the only two buyers in the relevant geographic market for an agricultural product, which can easily be substituted for authorship here. Their merger will enhance buyer power and depress the price paid to farmers for this product, causing a transfer of wealth from farmers to the merged firm and inefficiently reducing supply. These effects can arise even if the merger will not lead to any increase in the price charged by the merged firm for its output. But you have to show that it's going to inefficiently reduce supply. That's what the Department of Justice has put forth in all of these pages of their document, right? That authorship is going to go down, that customers are going to be negatively affected by the lack of variety in books made available. They can't argue the price point, which is the easiest to argue in a document like this. But those horizontal merger guidelines do suggest that the Department of Justice and Federal Trade Commission, when faced with a situation like this one, have advised that this is a reasonable method to bringing a complaint of this type. Now, I haven't seen one exactly like this. In fact, when we're talking about monopsony buyers, most of the cases I have seen are in like the medical field, talking about health plans and hospitals and what happens to physicians when patients are put into one block or another. And you can see those in the commentary to the horizontal merger guidelines if you're interested. But this is a little bit different, and they're going to have to make their case that consumers are affected in some manner, even though their horizontal merger guidelines suggest that they shouldn't be focused on that question. It's very, very interesting. Continuing, the proposed merger would eliminate head-to-head competition between Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster, depressing author pay and reducing the quantity and variety of titles published. It's almost like we just looked at the guidelines for what they might say on this question. If defendant's proposed merger is allowed to proceed, Penguin Random House would account for close to half of the market for the acquisition of U.S. publishing rights to anticipated top-selling books. Note how narrow that market is. The head-to-head competition between defendants has allowed authors of anticipated top-selling books to secure higher advances and other favorable terms. And then we have pages 
and pages and pages of the fact that Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster do compete to bid for authorship, which is fully true by everything that has been written about these two parties. And it's good that the Department of Justice can show that it isn't as convincing that there is a negative ramification downstream. Now, they don't think they need that because of those horizontal merger guidelines, but it will ultimately be up to the court system to determine. In the broader product market for content acquisition, the merger would harm a wide spectrum of authors who benefit from competition between Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster today. While smaller publishers can be competitive alternatives for some authors whose works are not anticipated to be top sellers, the merger is likely to harm any author who views Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster as close substitutes and would benefit from head-to-head bidding by these competitors. And then they have an example. Penguin Random House's successful final bid against Simon & Schuster was $15,000 higher and a difference that the author indicated would help pay for her son's college tuition. For whatever reason, we're putting a little bit of emotional beat in the middle of this document. $15,000 is $15,000. It's a lot of money to a lot of people. The fact that smaller publishers may be an acceptable alternative for certain authors will not protect other authors who have benefited from such competition. Again, they're trying to diffuse the primary defense, which is, what are you talking about? There's publishers all over the place, including ones that can spring up in this environment that we have in 2021. A reduction in author compensation is likely to lead to fewer authors being able to make a living from writing and fewer and less diverse books being published. In addition to eliminating head-to-head competition, the proposed merger is also likely to reduce competition by facilitating coordination between the remaining major publishers. And this is kind of an argument that, hey, if you've got five, that's an issue for coordination, which is illegal and can result in other problems down market. If you've got four, it's even easier to kind of coordinate your pricing and standardize all this stuff and not get into actual competition with each other. It says Penguin Random House would thereby cement its position as a key leader for other publishers to follow just in size. And oh, by the way, in 2012, the United States filed a complaint in the district court for the Southern District of New York, alleging that the big five publishers conspired with Apple to increase the prices of eBooks. And after the trial, the district judge found that Apple and the publishers had indeed engaged in price fixing, a judgment that was infirmed by the Second Circuit. So they're saying, well, this merger should also be stopped because this actually makes it easier for them to do bad things. That's probably true to some extent, but it also is highly suggestive that they apparently already did bad things. So the question becomes, is that enough here to block that merger? Maybe it's compelling. I don't know on that particular question. Let me know in the comments whether you think that's a compelling argument or not. They also say there's a lack of countervailing factors. Entry barriers are high and will increase with this merger. In addition to sufficient financial resources, infrastructure, and scale, a publisher needs name recognition and a demonstrated track record to convince authors of anticipated top-selling books to consider switching publishers. Well, that's probably part of it, but it certainly seems that if the price is being depressed by a large actor, that coming over the top of that price is something that can be effective for someone with capital and a will to do it. In addition, many smaller publishers lack distribution capabilities and depend upon Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster for those distribution services. These services include selling books to retailers and other customers, warehousing, order fulfillment and shipment, invoicing and collections and returns processing. The merged firm would have even greater control over distribution services, giving it more power over competitors and allowing defendants to raise competitors' costs or enhance barriers to entry or repositioning. I actually think this is potentially a great argument that they perform these other services. But what I would need in addition to this potentially great argument is all the stuff that you've talked about in the prior pages about what is the size of this market? What is the concentration? What does that look like? Because you're clearly trying to narrowly define the market as US publishing of anticipated sales. And that's a very narrow thing. You can tell by just the number of kind of caveats you have to put on it to get to that market definition. But when you say, hey, distribution services, how many folks are providing distribution services? What portion of that market do these two folks combine actually meet? That's a big part of this argument. It's not included, which tends to suggest to me that it actually isn't that concentrated, but could be wrong there. Could just be something that was skipped in making this document. B, there are no merger-specific efficiencies that outweigh the likely harm to competition from this merger. Defendants have claimed that the proposed acquisition would generate synergies by combining the operations, but Penguin Random House's own executives have raised doubts about these synergy claims. This sentence I highlighted because it's kind of weird. So they say Penguin Random House, the folks that are buying, have raised doubts about synergy claims. What do they use as evidence of this? The following two sentences. For example, Penguin Random House's COO, Chief Operating Officer, who is charged with integrating Simon & Schuster 
into Penguin Random House has characterized the Synergies task as extremely aggressive. Wait, what? The Department of Justice is trying to establish that the Synergy claims are bunk, that not even Penguin Random House actually believes them. And their first example is that the chief operating officer of the buyer has characterized the Synergies task as extremely aggressive. That suggests to me that they are serious about actually realizing Synergies and that they are extremely aggressive in attempting to do so. I don't know what the Department of Justice thinks that they have stated here, other than to suggest that the synergies task isn't actually going to be done in that way. The second sentence kind of suggests that. Similarly, Penguin Random House's global CEO testified that he is not convinced that Penguin Random House's US management will take the steps necessary to achieve the planned synergies. So that's kind of doubts that the US management will do enough. That's not exactly a doubt that their synergies are there to be had. It actually is suggestive to me that there might be a management conflict where they think the U.S. folks aren't going to do enough as suggested by the COO that says it's extremely aggressive and is going to take some actual work and effort to get done. Are those doubts about synergies or are they doubts about whether or not they're actually going to act well enough to realize those synergies? I think those are connected but distinct kind of conversation pieces. This is all we're going to get on this concept from the Department of Justice, however. To the extent the proposed transaction would result in any verifiable transaction-specific efficiencies in the alleged relevant markets, such efficiencies are unlikely to outweigh the transaction's likely anti-competitive effects. Just kind of a throwaway. Uh, it doesn't mean anything anyway. It doesn't even talk about what the synergies might be, including but not limited to a reduction in the author's price could result in more production and better competition uh, by these companies. So it's it's a hard thing to just kind of pass up if you're the Department of Justice. This merger will not provide a counterweight to Amazon's alleged buying power. They don't actually talk about this specifically other than to say, as we saw above, that the executives said that they want to be a partner for Amazon and that the global CEO has never bought into the argument that they would fight Amazon with this bigger group. Fine. And the proposed fix would not preserve competition. On September 20th, 2021, Penguin Random House announced that after the merger, it would allow Penguin Random House imprints and legacy Simon & Schuster imprints to bid against one another up to an unspecified amount. In short, after securing nearly half the market for publishing rights to anticipated top-selling books, Penguin Random House asks this court to trust that Penguin Random House will not use its market power to maximize profits for the benefit of its shareholders, but rather it will essentially compete with itself to reduce those profits. And again, you've got the reverse of that exactly, which is, okay, if they're reducing those amounts and increasing those profits and potentially selling books for less or selling more books to more, what are we talking about here other than a protection of kind of the author's guild? And how does that kind of meet up with our expectations under competition law? The violations alleged If allowed to proceed, Penguin Random House's proposed acquisition of Simon & Schuster would eliminate competition between Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster and would likely lessen competition substantially in the markets for content acquisition in the United States in violation of the Clayton Act. Among other things, the transaction would eliminate competition between those two. That's that's true. If, If two companies become one, it will eliminate competition between those. Facilitate coordination between the combined firm and the remaining big five publishers. Fewer publishers means coordination's easier. Okay likely cause author income to be less than it would be otherwise, maybe, likely cause a reduction in the quantity and variety of books published by the merged firm, not really seeing that argument come to fruition, and likely reduce quality, service, choice, and innovation. And they really didn't make that case much at all in this document. So the first one's tautologically true. That's true in every horizontal merger. Facilitate coordination, also true in every horizontal merger, might matter more in a highly concentrated market. That one could be a winner. Likely cause author income to be less, possibly. It depends on how the market responds to a merger of this type and what exactly happens if that number is reduced. They think, they are certainly asserting that if they reduce that advance, authors don't flee, don't go to other places, seek self-publishing or other things. Quantity and variety of books seems to be something that would be managed by the marketplace and this combined entity anyway, but they have to make that for the consumer welfare complaint. And then quality, service, choice, and innovation really wasn't made in this document at all. They request that Penguin Random House's proposed acquisition be adjudged to violate Section 7 of the Clayton Act, that the defendants be permanently enjoined and restrained from carrying out the proposed acquisition or any other transaction that would combine the two companies. That can't possibly be the final order, even if the Department of Justice wins. 
You don't know what the marketplace, including Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster, in 50 years actually looks like, whether we even read books anymore. So it wouldn't be a permanent injunction, I wouldn't think, uh, that the United States be awarded costs given their attorney's fees, and the United States be awarded such other relief as the court may deem just and proper. So the reason I went through all of this is one, I of course like talking about antitrust law with you all, hopefully making it a little bit more informational and educational than you might see in other places, but also because I really do think that the New York Times got this right, that this is evidence of a different direction that the Biden Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission is seeking to pursue that they are going to be looking at not just what we would consider competition in respect of consumer welfare, that competition leads to lower prices and higher quality and more innovation at that level that we can see, but also a kind of midpoint. A competitors need to be protected. Authors in this respect are competing with these publishers. They're asking for more money when the publisher would like to give less and that the publisher combining with a different publisher could result in giving less to those authors is something that might well be important. Certainly the horizontal merger guidelines suggest that the Department of Justice wants to be aware of these things and potentially bring lawsuits like this one, but also really putting aside that kind of consumer welfare standard as the big objective of antitrust litigation in this administration. And you can agree with that. You can think this is a great idea. I'm not as sure because I'm not as sure that the judiciary is going to agree with some of the analysis put forth by the Department of Justice in their horizontal merger guidelines in this lawsuit or elsewise. I would rather see these things addressed by Congress. If you want to reform the antitrust laws, the legislature can absolutely do that. Say, hey, we're not supposed to be taking into account just consumer welfare. It should be taking into account things like those middlemen, the authors, the suppliers, these competitors that exist in the middle between the producers and the customers, that you want to protect those things. The antitrust laws would have to be reformed to address that and to be certain that you're going to get through that court system. Remember, Cantor here says he's upset that judges have historically interpreted the standard. He can't actually affect that from his role at the Department of Justice. Neither can Lena Khan at the Federal Trade Commission. So we're left with what laws should be changed. But in the interim, we now know that the Biden administration and the Department of Justice is much more likely to make moves against consolidations at even smallish sizes, $2 billion, not that much in the grand scheme of things when we're talking about economies and economies of scale. And that certainly the stuff that we most often talk about here in virtual legality, those online platforms, those big technology companies should be aware that this just happened and should watch it with great interest. Hopefully in the same manner that you all watched this episode of virtual legality. If you find value in these conversations, please consider supporting the channel. I cannot do this. I can't spend the time researching all this and making these kinds of episodes without support from viewers and listeners like you. And I appreciate it so, so much. If you want to support the channel in other ways, we've got other ways to support it listed in the description of this video or just subscribing, ringing the bell, telling folks that we're having hopefully pretty unique conversations here in this space. Every little bit helps. And I'm so, so grateful for all of that as well. If you did catch this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.